Good morning. Can you please stand and gather with us to worship? His ghost is a fire. Love is like lightning Cracking through the sky and Burning through the rage Burning through the pain Of a billion scars Get ready Get ready The stories are true. His ghost is inside me. A holy fire burning wildly. Burning through the things that need to be erased to liberate my soul. spooky start to the uh, to the service this morning. Um, <clears throat> and in that spirit, tomorrow evening, 6 to 8 p.m., Trunk or Treat, Halloween night here in the parking lot. So uh, if you're planning to participate in that, uh, try to arrive certainly well before 6 o'clock to get your spot and to get your trunk set up. Um, moving forward, Fresh Express will be held November 17th from 3 to 5 p.m., as opposed to the traditional uh, first Thursday of the month. 
Blanket donations are continuing to be uh, received. There's boxes when you first walk in the first floor entrance area, as well as across the street, there's a bin for blankets. Community Thanksgiving dinner, uh, sign up sheet for that, if you're interested in volunteering and helping out with that, is out at the table, um, as well as point set up ordering envelopes. Um, again, information table for information there, and if you're looking to uh, order poinsettias, all orders for them are due no later than November 16th. And lastly, the Sister to Sister Conference will be held November 4th and 5th at Blanchard Church of Christ. Ladies, you're invited to join for the two days of encouragement. Please visit, once again, the information table for registration information. So as we move along, uh, the next song we're going to sing is Lion.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you uh, for this beautiful fall weekend. Once again, you bless us with uh, beautiful weather to enjoy, the changing colors, and, and just what you are making and what you are preparing to make for the upcoming season. And Lord, we thank you uh, that while the seasons change, you do not. And Lord, help us to remember no matter what we're going through, um, you are constant and you remain the same and you are always there and you are for us. Lord, we ask that you would be with today's message. We pray that you would Johnny as he presents what you've placed on him. And Lord, that uh, it would speak to the hearts and minds that are here present and will hear it later this week as they watch it virtually. And Lord, we just ask that you those who are unable to be with us today and we look forward to seeing their uh, speedy return. In this Jesus' names we pray, amen. Next song we're going to sing is Spirit Move.
to gather around the Lord's table and uh, partake in the emblems, um, our song of communion is going to be fires.
Read from uh, Revelation chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to pick up at verse uh, 8. It says, uh, The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with, the blood, and with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language, every people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And then if you jump down to verse 12, the people and the creatures cry out again in a loud voice. They sang, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever as we come around the lord's table we come here through the shed blood of jesus christ we come because the lamb was slain and we have been purchased by him for God to be a kingdom and to be a priest, to be priests. And as we come around the table and we remember the cost of our salvation and remember the cost of us coming into the kingdom of God, we ought to remember that he is worthy. He is worthy to receive every expression of praise, every ounce of devotion, all of our love, all of our gratitude. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord Jesus, we know that you are the Lamb who was slain and has been raised. And we know that our salvation is in you and by you and through you that there is nothing that we contribute to our salvation, that it's achieved by you and you alone. But you have called us out of darkness and into light. You have said in your word that when we have placed faith in you, we have gone from death to life. And because of these things, Lord, because we have forgiveness and salvation and eternal life in you, We acknowledge that you are worthy to receive power and honor and glory and strength and wisdom and wealth and honor and praise, and we love you. So as we take these emblems and we remember the means of our salvation was your body being broken and your blood poured out, we take these emblems in gratitude and in worship, thanking you for what you've done to save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we go to Lord in prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine. We thank you for your Son who gives us eternal life. We just ask you to be with us now and throughout the surface. Help us to glorify you in all that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First of all, Adrian Crosley. Not to put you on the spot, because I know that you probably are wanting to hide under your chair right now, but 
The last couple of weeks, I know you have been out of your comfort zone, being the sole vocalist leading us in worship. But I want you to know that you have done an excellent job in doing that. And I appreciate more than the quality of the, sir, of the, the singing, I appreciate so much you being willing to step into that role when it's needed. And I think you deserve to be commended for that. So thank you. Uh, in the first service, we received a prayer request for uh, a friend of Carolyn Savitz. Her friend's name is Hallie Fulmer, and Carolyn is asking that we be praying for Hallie and her family. Hallie is a young mother who has been hospitalized. I don't know why, and I don't know the circumstances surrounding it, but as at this point, Hallie has no brain activity. And so I would just ask you to be in prayer for this family uh, and that God would be with Hallie and with the family during this time. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll dismiss the young people to go to junior church. Father, we come before you again acknowledging your worthiness to receive praise and glory and honor and thanks we love you and we acknowledge that you are good and you are God and you are over it all. And we come before you in worship this morning. We lift up Hallie, Father, and we ask you to move on her behalf. We ask you, Lord, to, to bring healing for her, to restore her to health and to restore her to her family. But Father, we pray over all of it that your presence would be with the family and that as your will is worked out, that you would provide everything that Hallie and this family need. We pray, Father, that you will speak during this time, that you will give power to your word and to the message that you uh, have led me to speak this morning. And I pray, Lord, that none of this be coming from John Shirey, but rather at becoming from your Holy Spirit, and that it would have the impact and effect in our hearts that you desire for it to have, all for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, young people can be dismissed to go to junior church. And if you have a bulletin with the outline for today's message there on the bulletin, and we're intending to follow through uh, that outline. You can go ahead and put it away. Uh, this outline will not reflect today's message. Uh, I had been intending to preach that message uh, right up until last evening, and through the afternoon and into the evening last night, uh, as I was thinking about this morning and thinking about again about the message, I began to, uh, the Lord began to lay on my mind and on my heart a message that I had written years ago. And as the evening went on, the, the, uh, that, that message was just increasingly on my mind and on my heart. And so this morning, I'm going to do something I don't often do, uh, because while I do believe that the Holy Spirit leads in, in uh, spontaneous moments, I also believe the Holy Spirit works through preparation. And, and uh, I, I am a firm believer in uh, putting time and effort and preparation into a message rather than just trying to go off the cuff. But throughout the evening last night, I, I just became convinced that God was laying it on me to, uh, to preach this message this morning. And so uh, we're going to do that, and then, uh, Lord willing, next week we will uh, look at the message that I had originally uh, intended to preach this morning. But as we have just come through this series of sermons on the Ten Commandments, and more specifically than the commandments themselves, I feel like we were 
looking at the heart of God and the plan and the intention of God as he gave those commandments to us. What was his purpose? What was he striving to accomplish? And I, I hope and pray that along with me, you caught the vision of that being all about relationship. The commandments were never given to be arbitrary rules. They were never given as a means of us achieving a moral life and, and being saved through that. The commandments were God's way of reaching out in covenant relationship to his people and showing us that we need him. We need his righteousness because we cannot live up to the holy standard on our own. And so, um, as we have been talking about the commandments uh, for the last four or five weeks, last week we looked at Mark chapter 12. And as I said last week, Jesus, when he is asked what is the greatest commandment, he takes the first four commandments, the four initial commandments that, pri that, that focus primarily or exclusively on a, a, a person's relationship with God, that I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not worship any other image, you shall not take my name in vain, you'll remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Those commands that dealt with an individual's relationship with God, Jesus condensed those down into one simple commandment in Mark chapter 12. And that's in verse 29 through 30, Jesus says the most important one, the most important commandment, answered Jesus, is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Clearly, according to Jesus, the most important thing that we can do with our life is to love God with all that we have in us. But what does that look like? What does the life of someone who loves Jesus with all of their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength, what does the life of an individual who is in love with Christ look like? Because love is evident, isn't it? As we see love lived out in relationships, love is evident through the way that relationship is lived out. Can you think of a couple or of a relationship that springs to your mind that for you speaks of a love being lived out well and rightly? For me, one of the examples that jumps to my mind is my parents, my mom and dad's relationship with one another. My father loves my mother. He is head over heels for her. After 50 plus years of marriage, he is still absolutely in love with my mother and my mother with my father. And I grew up with the blessing of having two parents that adore each other and seeing what that kind of relationship is supposed to look like. And so when I think of what a love relationship is, that's an example that I think of. When I lived in Kentucky uh, and, and ministered at the Hillsboro Christian Church, there was a father and son, uh, David and Wes Robinson. And David was inseparable from his son, Wes, and Wes with his dad. They did everything together. They hunted together. They fished together. They did farm chores together. They, they, I mean, if, if you saw one, you saw the other. And I remember thinking as I observed their relationship with each other, that's what a father and son relationship should look like. That's a love relationship between 
a father and a son. So again, I would ask, what does the life of somebody who is in love with Christ look like? Because I think we know how to carry on human relationships. We, we don't do that perfectly, certainly. We, we all know that we aren't perfect in our relationships. But we know what expressing love in human terms means, right? What, should, what that kind of should look like. As a father towards my children... I know, you know, there's an old saying that kids spell love, T-I-M-E. And so I know that the amount of time that I spend with my children is a very real expression of love to them. I know that the, the doing things with them, taking them and, and involving myself in the activities that they are interested in or want to do along with me. I know that loving my wife should look like servant leadership within my household, that as Christ laid himself down for the church, I am to lay myself down for my wife and and consider her needs above and, and of greater priority than my own. And I know what it means to you know pursue her romantically still and and to continue to seek after her heart in our marriage. And so we know what human relationships and expressing love in a human way ought to look like. But again, how do we live out a love relationship with Christ on a daily basis? What does the life of someone who is passionately in love with Jesus look like? I think um, it's not uncommon at all if we were to ask people who identify as Christian, people who, who see themselves as a, as a follower of Jesus, if you were to ask them about their loving relation, if they have a love relationship with Jesus, if they were asked to validate that relationship, to verify that relationship? What, what is there that should stand as evidence for the authenticity of that relationship? When asked, I think a majority of us would naturally think to point to good works, would naturally think to point to morality and say, well, the evidence that I love Jesus is that I have done all these things, I do these good things, and I try to live a morally upright life, and therefore, uh, that's evidence that I love Jesus. But I want us to turn together to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles there. 1 Corinthians 13. This is very uh, famously known as the love chapter. And in this passage of Scripture, Paul is speaking to a congregation of believers that had been squabbling back and forth with each other, and they were trying to kind of jockey for position amongst themselves and decide who mattered the most in that congregation based on their spiritual gifts and their contribution to the body. And so in addressing all of that, uh, Paul has spent chapter 11 and chapter 12 dealing with spiritual giftedness and dealing with the parts of the body in the body of Christ and how that's all supposed to work. And then at the very last verse of chapter 12 and going into chapter 13, he then outlines what love is supposed to look like. And this is the passage where we we read love is patient, love is kind, it is not rude, it's not self-seeking, all of that. And I'm, I'm certain that most of us are familiar with that. But he precedes that. He, 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 
before he goes into all of the things that love does or doesn't do, this is what he says in in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now, I believe that one of the things that God's Word teaches us in this passage, by Paul saying, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, if I, I have the gift of prophecy and I have so much knowledge, and if I, if I give all I possess to the poor, if, 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 if I do all these things, One of the things that I believe that God's Word is teaching us here is that it is possible for us to go through the motions to perform these dramatic acts of generosity, of service, of, of, you know, ministry, and still not be operating out of love. If I do these things but have not love, but do not love, I'm nothing. I gain nothing. I'm only a noisemaker. And so, again, I think we need to ask, what does a life that is lived out in love for Jesus Christ look like? Turn back to Matthew chapter 7 with me, please. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is addressing the crowd that he has just preached the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, this is the conclusion of that message. And he says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I think these are probably the most, to me, I I see them as the most frightening verses in all of Scripture. The reason for that is, as I read this, it's clear to me that the people Jesus is talking about, they 100% expect that when the day of judgment comes, they will stand before the Lord and they will give a litany, they will give a list of all of the things that they have done, these good works that they have done in this life. And they expect, completely, they expect to be saved because of the good works that they've done. Lord, Lord, did we not? And then they give their list. And Jesus says about their works that they don't mean that they know him or that he knows them. Depart from me. I never knew you. So, clearly good works and a moral life on their own are not necessarily an accurate indication that we love Jesus. So, Again, what does the life of someone who passionately 
is in love with Jesus look like? How do we live out that day-to-day love relationship with the Lord? Well, I want to give us three, three suggestions that I believe speak of our love for Christ. First of all, a life that is passionately in love with Jesus is a life of loving service. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. And in that Gospel, this is the last chapter of John, and what's going on here? Jesus has been raised from the dead. He has now met Peter and the other apostles there along the Sea of Galilee. Peter had denied Christ on the night he was arrested, saying that even though everybody else might fall away, might desert Jesus, not Peter, not me, Lord, I'm going to stand by you no matter what. I love you more than all the rest. I am going to stand by you. And of course, we know how that went. Peter denied Christ three times, and he ran off like all the others. But here is Peter along the Sea of Galilee with Jesus, and we read this in John 21, 15 through 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. One of the things that I believe we take from this passage is the certain knowledge that if we love Jesus, that's going to translate into a life of serving and caring for others. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, then care for my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Then feed my sheep. Now, I expect that what you're probably thinking here at this point is, wait a minute. Didn't you just spend five minutes or more in the beginning of the service talking about how service, acts of service, good works are not necessarily an accurate indicator of a love for Jesus. And now you're sitting here saying that a life lived for Jesus, a life lived out of love for Jesus is going to be marked by acts of service. So are you speaking out of both sides of your mouth? or What's going on here? It seems like you're contradicting yourself, preacher. Well, I guess the answer depends on our motivation. See, if we're serving Christ and we are serving others in the name of Christ simply out of love for Jesus, out of a desire to please Him, honor Him, out of a desire to see His goodness poured into others' lives and then brought into a closer relationship with Him, then I would say, yes, those acts of service are evidence that we love Jesus. But if we're serving out of a begrudging sense of obligation, or if we are serving to impress those we serve or ingratiate them to us. If our service is flowing out of motivations like that, then it's not coming from a place of love. Instead, it's coming from a place of self-service, a place of pride or fear, and it's not reflective of a love relationship. But if we love Jesus, 
and we want our life to reflect that, Jesus said, if you'll love me, you'll obey what I command. And what did he tell us to do? Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. A life of love for Christ will be defined by a life of service to Him and to the church, but it needs to flow out of love and not out of some lesser motivation. Secondly, the life of someone who is passionately in love with Jesus is marked by holiness. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now, now that you've come into Christ, now that you've established relationship with Him, now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7 says that God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he, called, he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Now, we have spent quite a bit of time in this last sermon series on the Ten Commandments talking about the definition of holiness and what something that is holy, what does that really mean? And it, that means that we are set apart exclusively for God. Holiness means that we are set apart, that we are distinct from common things. And that's what we're being called to do. And again, a lot like the, the, the asking someone, you know, about their love for Christ and then pointing to acts of service, I also think it would be very common and very natural for us to point to uh, morality. And, and for many people in the church, they would characterize holiness as refraining from certain things and certain behaviors. And so, like... If I don't drink, that's an indicator of holiness. Or if I, if I don't cuss and swear, that's an indicator of holiness. Or if I'm not out carousing and, you know, all of that, then that means holiness. And to be sure, there is room to understand, and, and we ought to understand, that certain behaviors are unacceptable for a believer, and, and yes, we should not involve ourselves in those things, absolutely. But what I fear is that frequently we define holiness by what is absent from our life. Does that make sense? We say we're holy because I don't do A, B, and C. But I would suggest to you this morning that holiness is defined much more by what is present in our life instead of by what is absent from our life. Um, <clears throat> I think the Pharisees are a very clear example of this. The Pharisees of Jesus' day were the religious elite. They were looked at as the epitome of what a good Jew was supposed to be like. And yet, by Jesus' description, the Pharisees were very far from holiness. Let's look at that Matthew chapter 23, if you'll turn to that passage, Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28. 
And again, I would say that these men stand as, as an example, that we can live a straight-laced, morally uptight and upright kind of life and still not be people of holiness. Matthew 23, verses 27 through 28, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Again, I would say holiness is determined much more by what is present in our life and not by what is absent from our life. Because unfortunately, I have known people in the church who, from all external appearances, would say that they're holy, that they're righteous people. They don't drink and they don't curse and they don't, they they are very, very morally rigid and very morally right. And yet in those same people, I have seen a distinct absence of love or compassion or mercy, forgiveness. And we need to understand we can have Pharisees in the church today just like Jesus had Pharisees in his day and age. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, we read, but the fruit of the Spirit, and understand that these are character traits of Jesus Christ. And this is the fruit that should be born in us and be developing and growing in us as we are living life in Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. These things define who Jesus is. And if we are living a life that is in love with Jesus Christ, if we are seeking the the character of Christ to be developed in us, these things are going to be present in our life. They're going to be evident in the way we live and conduct ourselves with others. See, holiness is, again, defined much more by what is present in us than in what is absent from us. Number three, finally, a life that is passionately in love with Jesus is a life that seeks him. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Uh, This is uh, actually, this is one of my very favorite chapters in the New Testament. Uh, I believe that this chapter speaks so powerfully to understanding our identity in Christ and our Uh, our place in the plan and the will of God. Paul is speaking to the philosophers of the Areopagus, the Greek philosophers who spent a lot of their time debating the newest ideas and and, and all of that. Uh, He's in the city of Athens and he's gathered at the place where they would come together and sit and talk. And after having walked through the city and he'd seen how much worship of false gods was going on, Uh, he sits down and he he says in verses 22 through 27, he says, it says that Paul stood, stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that 
in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. And the reason that they had that up there was just in case in the, in the multitude of images and idols and gods that they were worshiping, in case there was a God that they had forgotten and overlooked, they didn't want that God to get mad at them and like curse them with droughts and plagues and things like that. So they put up this generic idol, this, 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 this image, this, this thing to worship at and said, to an unknown God. All right? And so he says then, now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to make known to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives, listen to this, he himself gives all men, and this is being spoken as in mankind, all people, he gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. Again, I think that speaks greatly of our identity in God's will and God's plan. You were made by God. None of us are here under random circumstances. He determined that you would live, that you would live here, that you would live now. It is God who has determined the times and the places set for all people to live. And listen to what it says then in verse 27. This is huge. God did this so that, here's the reason, there's no ambiguity here. There is no unclarity here. Scripture is crystal clear telling us why God intentionally made you and intentionally set you in this time and in this place. With 100% certainty, you can know this to be true. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. The reason God made you and put you here and now is so that you would seek him. In Matthew 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, meaning the concerns of life, will be given to you as well. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Are you seeing a theme in God's word? Seek, pursue, come after him. It is God's desire that we be people who seek him. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to seek God? And You know, I, I suppose there could be a very doctrinally correct, theologically sound wordy way to define that. But when you boil it right down, seeking God simply means spending time with Him and pursuing relationship with Him. It really is that simple. When you love someone, you want to spend time with that person, right? You want to be with them. How many of you have kids that live away And when they come to visit, or when you've been away from family and you get to be together again, that time is precious, right? When I was in my senior year of 
college at KCC. Jeanette had graduated before me. She's younger than me, but uh, I was a 25-year-old freshman at, at Bible College, so uh, she graduated a year before me. And uh, so while we were engaged, she was living with her parents and, and had a job as a teacher. Uh, and I was back at KCC. There was about a two-hour drive in between us. And so she would come to visit every other weekend or so, or sometimes I would go down to, to her. But because I had a weekend ministry, most often she would be coming to, to KCC to visit. And so 2003, uh, we were going to be married in June, but again, we're still in school and all that. So Valentine's Day weekend comes. And of course, you know, we have to be together on Valentine's Day. So she drove up from uh, her parents' place to the college. And uh, when she would stay with me, she'd stay in my apartment and I'd go stay in a friend's apartment overnight, but we could be together for the weekend. And so I was excited for her to be there. But she got there, I think Friday evening, we spent Friday and Saturday together. And Saturday night, this huge storm rolled in and it coated the state of Kentucky with an inch and a half to two inches of ice. I mean, solid ice over everything. It brought down trees. It brought down power lines. It shut the whole state down. The governor declared a state of emergency. It was a mess. And I was as happy as I could be because she was stuck at the college with me. She couldn't go home. She couldn't drive home because the roads were just terrible. So she had to stay with me for like a whole week. And it was like, woohoo! You know, I get to have this time with this person that I love more than anybody else in the world. When we love someone, don't we want to be with them? Be together, spend time with them? And it's the same with our relationship with the Lord. If we really love him, we're going to desire to spend time with him. We're going to seek him in his word, looking at the ways in which he has revealed himself to us. The things he's done in order to capture our hearts and restore us into right relationship with himself. The promises that he gives, the love that he expresses through all that he has written to us in his word. If we love him, we're going to spend time with him in prayer, talking with him, sharing our thoughts and our fears and our feelings with him and what's going on with us. We're going to seek God in worship as we pour out our affection and our awe and our gratitude to Him. Psalm 95, it says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And again, going back to Acts chapter 17, He has made us all men, all people, and He has set the times and dates that we would live. It is He as Creator that we are to bow down before here in Psalm 95. For He is our God and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under our care. And often our worship is expressed through songs and music like the praise team led us in this morning. And I'm always thankful for the praise team, both first and second services and the way that they help us come into the throne room and worship God through song. But often worship can be expressed without music as well. Sometimes worship can be expressed simply in a sense of awe at God's creation. Friday evening, I was up at our hunting camp with my dad, and I was sitting in a tree stand on the edge of a field. And Friday, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was a beautiful day. And as I sat there in that tree stand, up at our camp, there are a lot of uh, beech trees. And if you don't know what a beech leaf looks like, it's kind of oval in shape, and they hang on for a long time. 
Uh, a lot of the other trees, the oaks and the maples and all of that, they've dropped their leaves at this point. But the beech trees hold on to their leaves well into the winter months. But they've changed color. They're not green. They're now this golden, rusty kind of brown color. And the sun was setting over my right shoulder, just behind me. And as that sun got low on the horizon, it was shining through the canopy of trees. And it looked like the whole forest turned gold as the light filtered through those brown beech leaves. And I was just struck by the beauty of God's creation. And I just kind of closed my eyes and took a deep breath and sat there in that tree stand just saying, thank you, God, for the beauty of what you've made. Thank you that I get to just sit here and soak this in. Thank you that I get to breathe this cool air and see this beautiful creation and experience your goodness. And then a big doe came out and I shot her. But so, it, you know, we have, God has given us so much and he has blessed us with so much. And sometimes worship of him just means sitting in awe of what he's made and with our heart pouring out of us just say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes worship is expressed in poetry or art or even in just sitting in silence before God. But seeking God is simply intentionally involving ourselves in an activity that is meant to connect us with God, to spend time with Him, to deepen our relationship with Him. Because I love my wife, I pursue her in relationship. If we love God, we will pursue Him in relationship. And I'm going to wrap up this morning by saying this. We were made to live in covenant relationship with our Creator. He is determined, again, going back to Acts 17, He is determined the times and the places that we would live so that we would seek Him. He wants relationship with us. It's all about relationship. Everything that God has done throughout history has been done to establish or to restore or to maintain relationship with us. Has it ever crossed your mind, and this is something that, that went through my, that I've been thinking about for a week or two now. Has it ever crossed your mind that the entire expanse of creation, everything that God has made, every star, every moon, every planet, every galaxy, this planet, the oceans, the mountains, has it ever crossed your mind that God did all of that to give us a place to stand so that we could know him. That, that's what it's all about. All of this, all of creation, all of history is all about us having relationship with the God who has made us for himself to live in loving relationship with him. And what does that loving relationship look like? Well, it's a life of service motivated by love. It is a life of holiness. Not so much, I don't do all of these things in a rigid morality, but a life of holiness in that it reflects the character of Christ. It is a life spent seeking God. Do you have that kind of relationship with him? If you're here this morning and you don't, then we want to extend the invitation for you to step into relationship with him. 
to freely receive the, the gift of salvation and grace and forgiveness that Christ offers. Or maybe your relationship with him hasn't been where it needs to be and you recognize that and you need to, to repent. You need to rededicate yourself to him and you want to do that. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you've got a testimony to share. Whatever it is that the Spirit might be leading you to do, we invite you to come as we sing our invitation hymn or invitation song.